Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. And I'm Joy J. Moore. This week we um, move into um, the God's Promise to Abraham for September 15th, 2024. And a lot has happened between um, last week uh, where we were uh, just in Genesis 3, if we were counting the mm-hmm. chapters, and now we've moved to Genesis 15. And uh, there's a lot that is um, not being rehearsed as we enter in this time. Um, but we'd like to highlight for you uh, the promise of God that is being continued here. And uh, the one uh, you've heard me uh, point to before is that God's call of Abraham is in response to God's love of all creation and all the world. And so we see that in one of the stories that are skipped in this reading, in this quick passage, and that would be the story in Genesis 11, which is the end of uh, the primordial history, uh, the prologue to the story, which sets everything up. But it ends with those nations that we've been introduced in Genesis 10, choosing again to put God up in the sky that they will go to on their own time. And God, out of God's love for all humanity, scatters the people throughout all creation, and then moves to make a promise with Abraham and Sarah for the sake of all of those scattered nations. And in Genesis 15, we move in to where we've had Abraham respond to God. Abraham and Sarah have, um, and I've, I've jumped ahead in the story because I'm I'm using their changed names. Uh, So uh, when we get here in Genesis 15, we've already had Abram and Sarai having responded to God. And that brings us to having known that God is going to keep a promise with them. We're now walking with them. And that's what brings us to this scene in Genesis 15. Yeah, thanks, Joy. That it's important to fill in that uh, that intervening material. I mean, we've skipped a lot, right? Cain and Abel and the flood and uh, and the Tower of Babel, but uh, but we 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 get those in other uh, years in the narrative lectionary. We should mention that as well. But this this focus now on Abram or Abraham. Um, is uh is just so foundationally important for not just for the Old Testament but really for the whole Bible. So there's this sense that in that primordial history, right, the uh, God God creates and promises uh, 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 Adam and Eve uh, uh, life and and that God will be with them and Cain and Abel uh, mess it up and then. Uh, and then the whole population messes it up, and so God tries again with Noah and his family, and they mess it up. Uh, eventually, Noah himself, uh, in that strange story uh, about getting drunk, uh, and and then the the Tower of Babel story, and so it seems like God is is creating a new again and again, and now with Abram, uh, and particularly starting in chapter twelve, where God promises Abraham descendants and land. Uh, and blessing, and uh, and and yet that promise doesn't seem to have been fulfilled. So that by chapter fifteen, our text for today, uh, Abram sounds uh, doubt doubtful or or even despairing. Uh, Abram says, "Oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. You have given me no offspring." And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. So, you know, Abram's, uh, Abram left his land. He, he followed God's uh, call. He believed God's promise. And yet uh, all these many years later, he still doesn't have an heir. Right? So the promise has been given, but 
but the promise seems to be in peril, right? It's hard to have, it's hard to be the father of a great nation if you don't even have one child, right? Uh, and so, uh, so Abram uh, uh, questions God, which is fine. Uh, uh, God doesn't seem to mind that. Uh, but God then reiterates the promise and makes it even more detailed, right? This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. Look toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to count them. So shall your descendants be. And then the key verse here, uh, verse six, and he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is a huge verse for Paul later in the New Testament, right? That that Abram in the face Abram at first believes the promise and then he begins to doubt. And then God reiterates the promise. Uh, the promise seems to be in peril. Uh, uh, but uh, after God reiterates the promise, uh, uh, Abram believes the Lord uh, and that faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. So, uh, yeah, the, the promises of God. I think we can all <laughs> we, we can all uh, empathize with Abram, right? Uh, you said you would do this, God. I don't see it on the ground. What do I do now? That's where faith comes in, right? It's the the assurance of things hoped for and uh, what the assurance of things not seen. I'm not quoting that quite right from Hebrews chapter 11, but uh, faith is is the trust in God in the face of all evidence to the contrary, and that's what Abram does in this uh, in this chapter. I'm grateful for. Uh both your insights uh, and framing of this story. Um, if you took Abraham's um, statements from verses one and verse two out, and you just read them as a poem, they would read as a lament psalm, a, a, a brief uh, lament psalm, that God comes here and God's already, um, God's already, uh, created a very difficult task for God, that God is going to have this one people to be the priestly people to bless all the nations. And God has chosen the, ver the very first childless um, uh, barren couple, uh, Abraham, and, uh, Abram and Sarai. Uh, and then all this years have gone by now, so they're getting too old, extra difficult. And then God, like, as you says, as you say, in verse 1, uh, if you put this in um, in the prophets, uh, pro uh, prophetic scholars would call this a um, oracle of salvation. That is good news, because God appears and says, "Be not afraid," and that doesn't mean Abram's afraid, but rather it means what you're about to get is good news. Um, and so, having then given received this good news. Um, Abram starts to argue back and says, I don't want to hear anything about this because um, <laughs> you haven't kept your promise. Uh, and then, um, yeah, you, Catherine, you've already um, hit the key points in between, but I have, I have a question for you uh, and then a funny story, or actually the funny story, right? The look towards the heavens and count the stars. We have a, we have a, a Hitchi uh, framed little poster of his drawing of this. And when my son was very little, they had studied this in Sunday school and he came home and he said, yeah, if you go outside at night and look at the stars, that's how many kids you're going to have. Uh, <laughs> which, oh. you know, that would be a lot of kids. Uh, but um, the more uh, serious question, Catherine, is, and you study this more than I do, in, in, in Hebrew it only says, he believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Uh, and so some people think that the he reckoned it to him as righteousness is actually Abraham reckoning it to God. And I just was wondering if you had a thought about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you do have a, a, or you should in your Bible have a footnote there that that second uh, word Lord is, uh, is, as you said, Ralph, just he. So he believed the Lord. Obviously, Abraham believes the Lord. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So Abram, is it is it God reckoning righteousness to Abram because of his trust in the Lord? Or is it uh, kind of a, 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 a another way of saying that Abram believed the Lord and reckoned it, uh, reckoned that promise to the Lord as righteousness? 
it's not traditionally interpreted that way. So I guess I, I kind right. of automatically go to the Lord reckoned it to Abram as righteousness. And that's, of course, you know, how Paul uh, interprets it as well. So, uh, yeah, so I, it's possible, but I don't know what it, I'm not sure what it would mean to reckon righteousness to the Lord, I guess. Yeah. Uh, maybe just another way of saying, uh, you know, he believed the Lord and believed that the Lord was righteous and would fulfill uh, God's promises. But I do, I, I do kind of like the traditional interpretation myself. <laughs> yeah. It's, it I, fits I, with your statement, Ralph, as you began that this is Abraham, uh, Abram's lament uh, that there has been a delay on what was already an incredible promise. You know, we're already old, we're already barren, uh, and you're going to do this to us. This is great. We're on it. And now what we thought was going to happen tomorrow uh, hasn't happened for years. And uh, it, it's a challenge, I think, to us to receive this delayed narrative in our own lives because we have so many yet fulfilled promises of God, uh, even from, you know, the scripture itself yet, even from Old Testament yet, you know, the um, swords will be turned into plowshares. Um, we, we, what are we doing? How are we reckoning to God while we wait on God's next move to fulfill that promise that got us up this morning? Uh, so it's a, it's an unusual um, translation, uh, not unusual, unusual. I mean, I know there are scholars that have looked at it, but Rolf, I think that there's that there's some angst in human imagination right now that there might be some people who who could, you know, lean into what does it mean to when God has not done what God has promised yet, but God says, trust me that we say, I believe you, God, you're righteous. That's a great ending, but I want to add one more note, and that is that the word translated here is reckoned, we're going to run into next week. Um, and this is so, it's a, an important word that ties together uh, uh, a lot of Genesis. Um, uh, and so you might want to dig into it a little bit if you're preaching on this text, then you're preaching again next week, that... Um, here, uh, going back to, to the traditional uh, interpretation, God is um, thinking about and, and counting Abraham's righteous uh, faith as righteousness. And next week, Joseph is going to see how God got, Joseph is going to say God has done the same thing, that God has counted the brother's sins as not mattering.